Hi, everyone. I'm Marilyn Turkovich, uh, the Executive Director of the Charter for Compassion. And I'm thrilled today uh, to have with me a group uh, from Edinburgh who have been working on compassion issues in various aspects of a compassionate community. And so I'll be introducing them one by one. They in turn will say a little bit about themselves. We've been doing this as a series uh, for the last 18 months or so. Uh, and you can go back to the charter website under communities and in the right hand bar, you'll find that you'll have recordings of previous uh, interviews and webinars that we've had from India and Mexico, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and now adding today, uh, Edinburgh. We have a lineup all scheduled for next year as well. We'll be releasing that towards the end of the year. Uh, our hope is, is that we'll have one city or one community, one country, uh, each month of uh, 2021. So I am so excited, as I said, to, to be here. Um, the charter has registered over 400 cities. Doesn't mean that every one of them are totally active, but there are 114 plus uh, that have actually signed the Charter for Compassion with their local city councils and governments uh, and have created action plans. And we've been interviewing and working with all of those various cities to give people an opportunity to see exactly what's happening. And so what I'm going to do today is to start out by introducing Adam McVeigh, who's a leader in Edinburgh from the city council. And Adam's going to tell you a little bit about himself, but especially about the work that's happening in the field of compassion in Edinburgh. Adam? Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks so much for... Um, paying attention to, to Edinburgh and Edinburgh's work because I think we've got quite a good story to tell. Um, hopefully uh, you can hear me and hopefully I come across clear throughout, but I'm relying on a kind of small personal device because Zoom is on the blacklist, unfortunately, for council. Um, so I'm uh, Adam McVeigh, I'm leader of the council. I've been leader since 2017. I'm the first SNP leader that the city's uh, ever had in its thousand odd year history. Um, which is quite a it took us quite a while to to get there, and then it was me. So um, I'm sure a, a pleasure to some, a disappointment to others. Um, but it's me, like a lumpet. Uh, what we've really defined our administration work on is is two things. One, having a planet for the next generation, the generations to come, and driving down carbon emissions and building sustainability into everything right across uh, our our work as a city um, and I think that's well articulated in ambition we've got to become a net zero carbon city by 2030 but the other lens is about poverty reduction and really putting that absolutely front and centre of all of our plans we prioritise housing, homelessness um, right from, from day one, tackling the things that need to be tackled to give people the foundation to, to really enjoy everything has to offer because I do believe regards to where you're coming from, um, as in a geographic sense, uh, from, from people attending this webinar, that I do think Edinburgh is the best place in the world to live, but it's not the best place in the world to live for everyone. You do need means to get around, you do need means to access the amazing culture that exists here and everything that Edinburgh has uh, to offer. Um, the work we've done has been absolutely embedded right across the organisation and, and services, so the one in five uh, um, child poverty campaign, trying to raise awareness right across the board and try and help people, whether they're social workers, teachers, uh, really anyone that's coming into contact with a family, trying to embed that understanding of what poverty means for families and individuals and, and particularly young people uh, so that we can help make sure those are not barriers to, to success for people um, going forward. It's also worth saying in this rather strange world that we've lived in during 2020 there has been an enormous amount of compassion built into our services our funding our uh, how we've went about um, business as usual which has had to change absolutely dramatically in the last eight months so 
um, whether it's building community resilience for food delivery, and there's been a huge amount of community resilience sprung up across the city, facilitated a lot of it by the council and helped by the council, but a lot of it not. A lot of it based on local organisations uh, taking their community capacity, their resources, and building that um, that resilience within within themselves. A huge amount of of things um, processed in terms of payments. One of the, the clear recommendations, um, I should say actually one of the things we did a few years ago was kicked off a poverty commission, which was getting lived experience from people right at the heart of how we can consider these issues. And that has really driven, uh, it's just actually recommend give and that is people who live in poverty don't have enough money it was on your face it's something that everyone has to face up to for us to meaningfully tackle poverty it's not just about the support that's put in place in schools and other public institutions it's about the cash in hand that people have to be able to live their lives properly so the welfare payments that we've processed the thousands of them during covid the additional 500 pound payments which 38,000 has now been processed in the last couple of uh, days to people right across the city. All of that is driving towards that aim of um, the people who need it right at the heart of support. Um, I'm quite proud of that effort. I think during COVID has been a good example where you've seen communities come together and council really working with government um, and putting the resources where they need to be. And I think compassion it's been absolutely the heart of that, taking the, the support that people need, um, spreading that equality across our city and making sure that everyone has access to, to what they need um, going forward. So there's a huge amount I could probably talk about in terms of compassion within the organisation, but I think during the, the eight months that we've had of, of COVID and however many months more that this will be uh, being lived through, the priority for the council is not going to change. It's going to be about supporting the people who need it the most throughout the next um, period as much as we can. And beyond that, medium term, long term, it's about building in our employment industry um, or, or across various sectors, actually, in terms of employment, fair work principles, building the, the it's about building the safety. In, uh, pushed out of poverty as quickly as possible if they find themselves in that situation. The one in five campaign is a depressing campaign for me because actually right now we are short of one in four. The numbers are going in the wrong direction um, in our city and unfortunately we don't have the power over all of the, the things that we need from the UK government to be able to address things meaningfully and unfortunately we have a UK government that seems hell-bent on prioritising um, other things other than tackling poverty across our, our city and our country. So um, obviously, we'll continue to do what we can, continue to work with Scottish Government, continue to work with the UK Government, if they'll, if they'll let us, and drive down meaningful change and put people who really need support at the heart of everything that we do. And I think that's correct. Kind of and in the next 10 years, as we try and eradicate poverty from our city and really drive, uh, drive up quality of life for everyone, I think... Thank you, Adam. We had a bit of conductivity uh, problem with you, but I think we really did get the message. And thanks for hanging in there. I, before we continue, I, I just want to make note that we have two Harriet Harris's and we have two uh, Trishnas Singh. So um, maybe if you can rename yourself, uh, going up to the upper right hand corner of your picture or the block and you'll see three dots and you'll be able to hopefully uh, change your name so that we know exactly who you are. Um, and we're going to move on because I, as you can see on the screen we have a number of people um, who will be sharing some stories and, and their work uh, with Compassion. And Trishna Singh from the Sikh Sanyong uh, is the next person. And my apologies if I didn't correctly say the name of the organization. So Trishna, you are on. Well, hi, everyone. And thank you for inviting us to this. It's very um, 
you know, we're really honoured to be part of such a huge, big global organisation. Uh, my name is Trishna Singh and I'm the founder and director of Sikhs and Jog. And we are the only Sikh family support charity in the whole of Scotland. We've been delivering services for the past 30 years. And um, over this the year, over this year of the pandemic, it's kind of made us realise that all of the work that we have been doing over the years actually just fits in and it's um, fitted in with everything that's happened. It's actually where our services have expanded. So what we were already delivering, working with people from the Sikh community, but also people from other ethnic communities, especially women and their families, and to ensure that they were part of the community and the fabric of the community, there's many, many stigmas attached, and you will know, Marilyn, with working across the globe in places like India, the culture, people, although we have had, um, you know, communities over here for maybe over 100 years, but the culture of those communities goes with them. And so there are so many stigmas attached to anything to do with poverty, um, children, domestic violence, abuse, all of these things are very, very much hidden. And so we have worked very hard to make sure that people are able to access services in a cultural uh, way that suits their culture, meets their needs, but also gives them the support that they need to be able to live in this society. And so I have with me today Sunita Potival, who is our social enterprise and social media manager. And I'm going to hand over to her so that she can take forward and explain to you what we've been doing over the past year. Sunita. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm the social media and enterprise manager. I've been with Six and Joke for seven years now, and uh, my role has changed a couple of times in that in that duration. Um, most recently, going from feeding people with food to feeding people with social media posts um, of all the work that Six and Joke and the team have been doing. So like everyone around the world, we had to adjust the way that we worked in our offices um, and get digital as soon as possible. And I just want to take a moment here to highlight how this was a, a, a new step for us as our work involved face-to-face um, -face and hands-on with, with our service users. So it was a huge achievement um, to be able to do this so quickly um, after 30 years, um, especially with the barriers that we work around uh, with uh, our poverty and language. I would like to use my time to just share some statistics with you, um, which our Six and Jog and Punjabi Junction teams have achieved in the last nine months um, since COVID hit in March. Um, I'd like to start with our outreach team. We they have uh, made over a thousand phone calls um, to service users. A hundred of these being video calls. Um, up to 20 of these have been um, of befriending bodies, which have been set up all over Edinburgh. Over 50 families are now with food parcel deliveries on a weekly basis. 15 new referrals have been made, plus over 15 partnerships and networks established to further support the service users. Four women have been provided with uh, police protection and support from domestic abuse. Over 20 families and individuals have received laptops, tablets, um, Wi-Fi dongles, mobile phones to keep them connected with their family um, and each other, and but also with us as well. Um, and overall, we, we are hitting up to 100 service users that have been supported in the last uh, nine months. Uh, moving on to our youth group team. 24 activity boxes were put together to encourage fun time at home. The annual seven week summer club that we do um, every year went online and was not canceled. A total of 30 weeks of youth group online sessions will have been completed by the Christmas break. These have consisted of a variety of activities, games and discussions which have kept um, our young members emotionally and mentally happy, as well as connected. Onto our health and wellbeing group, we were able to get our senior members um, online for the first time um, for 10 weeks, uh, weekly meetings. They, over 40 women participated in this. It was a huge learning for them and for us. Um, a summer project of gardening tomato plants and cucumbers, watermelons was set up in the summer where 20 women participated. 
and over 10 families volunteered their time um, to cook and pack meals for their neighbours, local communities, surgeries and friends with the support of Sikhs and Rogue. Finally, just a little bit about our social enterprise. Um, like many other uh, um, cafes and restaurants in the hospitality industry, we suffered quite a lot um, since, the, since March. Um, all our events and services that we have, uh, including weddings, catering, festivals, markets, uh, fast food outlet, etc., all came to a halt. Some of these have been postponed, some of them are still postponed, some of these are cancelled, uh, some of them may happen next year. But we are still happy to say that we were able to cook and pack and distribute over a thousand hot meals across Edinburgh in the summer months with the help um, and collaborations with other organizations. I just wanna end with saying that although many of, although for many the pandemic has been devastating for Sikhs and Jog, it has kind of been a savior. Um, never before have we felt more needed to, to the people and families that we support. And so with many um, kind words of gratitude that we have received from all our service users. We believe that showing some compassion in any form right now um, really is powerful and beneficial for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Are you out of breath? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing. That was great. Thank you. Uh, just a little message to all of the panelists from uh, Brenda Gustin, who's in Northern California, and she wants to thank you all. Uh, for sharing what you are doing compassionately throughout Edinburgh. And she is, uh, as I mentioned, is with the charter in one of the local groups in California. Uh, I didn't know, Sabrina, if you wanted to add something to what's already been said. Um, I think Sunita's covered everything, um, okay. but I'm happy to kind of answer any questions or anything okay. like that. We'll be doing questions right at the end, and I'm going to turn it over at that time to, to Mary Catherine, uh, who has been really instrumental in um, acknowledging the work of the Charter internationally and sparking uh, some things going on in Edinburgh, and uh, she has been our real um, uh, coordinator of efforts. And so I'll, at that point, when it comes time for questions and answers, turn it over. I did want to say one thing, uh, Sunita, that the charter for since March uh, has been working with youth from around the world. And uh, we've been having conversations in hopes of having a youth gathering, a compassionate youth gathering, which I think right now is, is being called an unconference, but I'm not quite sure. But nonetheless, uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to contact you so that maybe we can bring in youth from Edinburgh, which would be really exciting. We have youth That's from all it. over the world participating. It's a great opportunity for them to be speaking with one another another so yeah. uh, look for an email okay as we move on uh we're we're going to go to Aisha Malik uh and uh she represents the Shakti Women's Aid uh in Edinburgh Hello, hi everyone. Thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, so my name's Aisha, I'm from Shakti Women's Aid. Um, I've been with the organisation for just over four years. Shakti Women's Aid, if you're not aware, um, have been around for just over 30 years. Um, we're an organisation that help BME women, children and young people experiencing or who have experienced domestic abuse um, from a partner, um, ex-partner or any other member of the household. So we recognise um, that domestic abuse doesn't just come from a partner, it can come in BME communities, it can come from extended household uh, members. Um, our offices, we are based in Edinburgh, however we do also have an outreach service we cover um, areas such as Tayside, Aberdeen, Forth Valley, Fife, um, Falkirk, Edinburgh and the Lothians. So we do cover quite a large sort of area, um, but our main office we are based in um, Edinburgh. 
Um, we work closely with the Scottish Government, with Police Scotland, NHS and many other statutory and voluntary services um, and Sikhs and Jog is one of them. Um, um, we're affiliated by Scottish Women's Aid. We've got 25 members of staff. Um, most of our staff speak between one to three languages. So we've got a very diverse team. Um, the team consists of, well, it's divided into three different teams. Um, the first, the main one is um, the adult support and advocacy team. Um, and they, just to give you an idea of what we've been doing. So since lockdown, um, the women's team and the outreach team have supported 367 women um, with regards to housing issues in terms of accommodation when they fled domestic abuse, with immigration issues such as visa or if they've got no recourse to public funds. We've helped them with benefits such as, you know, things like helping filling out forms, letting them know what they're eligible for, um, you know, things they can apply for. We've helped with food parcels um, and, and, the, and the women's team also um, helped with, you know, providing emotional support to these women and the 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 aim is really to empower these women um, to sort of, you know, get away from the situation that they're in and be able to rebuild their lives. Um, the outreach team, um, they are basically there for clients who haven't yet left their um, abusive partner or, you know, the abusive situation that they're in. Um, so we can still provide and we have continued to provide support to women and young children and young people um, who are still living with the perpetrator. Um, and in that, in those instances, the main sort of focus, again, is to empower them to make their own decisions so that if and when they do decide to leave, um, we are there to support them and we continue supporting them through that whole journey, um, you know, through emotional support, safety planning, so that they're aware um, of what their options are. Um, the third service is the children's service. So I'm the team leader for the children and young people's service. Um, the, the children's service, um, uh, we provide one-to-one -one support and that is in the form of therapeutic intervention. That is for children that are aged five plus um, all the way up to the ages of 18. Um, the therapeutic intervention consists of things such as play therapy, art therapy, um, and we give the children and young people coping strategies to overcome their trauma. Um, we also provide practical support. So things such as if a family have just recently fled domestic abuse and they need support with nursery enrollment, school, school enrollment, they're struggling financially, they need to, the children need new school uniform, they need clothes, food, toys, educational support, advocacy. We provide support for all of that. This year, since lockdown, we've actually provided support to 182 children and young people um, in Edinburgh and the Lothians. We also um, have continued, um, despite obviously the lockdown, we've continued um, delivering activities, um, but it has been obviously um, done virtually. So we had um, online activities, you know, where we've had clients coming on and it's given the opportunity to the children as well as the mums to get that little bit of interaction, um, you know, during these difficult times. Um, we've also, during this period, we've provided to the 182 children, we've provided activity boxes, um, we've provided games, we've provided a monthly activity packs. We also created right at the start, because um, we recognise a lot of our BME clients English isn't their first language. There was a lot of confusion around sort of what coronavirus is, what the restrictions are, what the limitations are, what can they do, what can't they do. So we created a child-friendly um, leaflet on coronavirus, which really helped. Um, and it actually helped the women as well. We also translated it into five different languages for the women and children whose first language isn't um, English. We were delivering food parcels to door to the doors of clients who were self isolating. Um, so yeah, we've been we've been very busy um, during this lockdown, and our aim is to continue empowering women and children um, who are experiencing domestic abuse. Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, we're going to we're going to move on to Beth Katz, um, and I know that she's here. There you go. Uh, Hi, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me all right. My internet's been a little, <clears throat> excuse me, sketchy. Um, and I also want to apologize if a five-year-old or a one-year-old busts in when I'm talking for a minute. Uh, Tis the witching out here, but it's wonderful to be with you all. 
Um, and thank you so much for having me. And it's just, it's such a, it's such a, an honor to be with people that are doing other really wonderful work in the community. So I, I really appreciate this. Thank you. Um, so I'm a researcher at the University of Edinburgh uh, and I'm pursuing my PhD in politics and international um, relations. Uh, and I'll talk about my research in a second, but um, I just wanted to, to give thanks to Mary Catherine for all the work that she's done to organize this and Marilyn and the others at the Charter for Compassion. Before I came to Edinburgh um, to pursue my PhD, for about uh, 10 years, I founded and ran an NGO in the US based in Omaha, Nebraska um, called Project Interfaith um, that was actually a, a member of the Charter for Compassion and um, we were really focused on uh, creating, trying to help create and facilitate spaces where people could, um, could really openly discuss and explore religious and cultural and spiritual identity and experiences. And so I come to my work, um, not purely from an academic um, lens, but also very much as a practitioner. And that's the spirit in which I came to do this research. And so my current research that I'm focused on is I'm looking at um, how those who are involved in efforts to welcome and include immigrants in the US and the UK are experiencing um, their efforts and the larger um, political climate since Brexit and since uh, President Trump's inauguration in the US. So I'm really interested in looking at how does the national political environment, how is that being perceived by people who are working um, in communities to welcome and include immigrants? Do they perceive it as being welcoming or unwelcoming? And how do those perceptions then shape how they try to move forward with um, their efforts to welcome and include immigrants? Um, so far, uh, I think that there are many people who, um, from the research that I've, I've begun to do so far, um, it seems that there is a, a pervasive sentiment in both um, countries from the people that I've been able to, to, uh, re to receive feedback from that uh, the climate is significantly less welcoming um, at this time. And I think that that is really important for us to document. And I think it's really important also though um, to capture this because I think it's, it's helpful to show people that even in challenging times, people go forward with these efforts with this, their commitment to creating more compassionate and connected communities. And I think it's very important for us to look at how do people collectively and individually adapt to, to this environment and what can we be doing to support these efforts in the different forms that they take. So that's the nature of the research that I'm doing. And so for this first phase of my research, I have um, a survey that I'm circulating that I invite anyone who is involved in um, efforts to welcome and include immigrants um, in the US or in the UK, wherever you are based, whether that's in Scotland or England, Northern Ireland or, um, or in Wales or in the US in any of the states um, that are part of it, um, to take the survey and share your experiences um, about how, how your efforts are going at this time and how you're perceiving the national government's approach to immigration and how that's impacting you. So I will go ahead and um, send along the contact information. Uh, if you go to the website that I have, bethcats.org as well, you can contact me and I can send you a link to the survey. I'd be really grateful for as many um, people willing to share their experiences as possible. And then after that, um, once I, the survey ends at the end of this year, um, I wanna be, I, I'm going to interview people further to get even more detail about uh, their perceptions and their efforts um, on how they're welcoming and including immigrants at this time in this in the Trump and Brexit era. So that's the nature of my research and, um, and the spirit in which I'm offering it. And I just know, I guess, from my practitioner background, um, it was extremely helpful when I was working um, at an NGO to hear about the experiences of others, um, both to inspire, um, to give me different ideas, to give us different ideas, to foster collaboration. And so I think that's part of what's so critical too, is that hopefully this research um, helps us better understand and document what's going on right now, but also creates greater connectivity and collaboration if possible among people's efforts to do this really important work to welcome and um, include people. 
And I just want to offer one last, uh, if I may, um, reflection. And now that I am technically an immigrant myself, living in the UK, originally from the US, um, in terms of feeling welcomed and included, one of the most powerful acts that I've experienced since I've been here is um, in August, the Scottish government gave those of us who live here, um, but aren't citizens, we're residents, the right to vote uh, in Scotland. And that was incredibly powerful. Um, my grandparents came to the US because they had faced a lot of persecution and challenging circumstances. And I remember as a child, my grandfather sharing the, how impactful it was that he was able to vote in the United States. And so I always grew up feeling like that was very sacred. And then to come to a country where I, as someone who is a resident, but not a citizen was afforded that ability to participate on that level has been incredibly moving to me personally. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that because I think that's incredibly powerful and an incredibly welcoming gesture that the Scottish government has allowed for us. So I just wanna thank you so much again for giving me space to share about my work. And I look forward to connecting with the other panelists as well as those of you who are out there doing the wonderful work you're doing in the different communities you're based in. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And I think that we might be able to help with a number of cities that are welcoming refugees, especially in the United States. So oh, that would do, be get in, do get in contact with us. We're gonna move on uh, to Johnny Kinross uh, from the Grass Market Community Project. And thank you, Johnny, for coming. Hello, um, good evening, everyone. And thank, thank you again, uh, uh, as everybody else has acknowledged for the opportunity really appreciate it. Here's such uh, um, incredible stories and wonderful work that people are doing. And um, I'm a huge fan of Sik Sang Jog. I've eaten lots of their food over the years and uh, been part of the sort of social enterprise community that includes uh, Sik Sang Jog for many years. So my name is Johnny Kin Ross. I'm the CEO of the Grass Market Community Project. I have been for six years, um, prior to which uh, I was a social worker and I became a bit of a social entrepreneur when I was working in the north of Edinburgh, an area of Muir House, uh, an area of multiple deprivation in Edinburgh. Um, then I came across the Grass Market Community Project, uh, which had just recently moved into this uh, building that we're in now, our, our community centre. So albeit we are a community project, we serve more of a community of interest across the whole city uh, uh, and, and beyond. Uh, more about that later. Um, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary this year Sadly, under the circumstances of COVID, that was online rather than doing what we do well, which is bringing people together physically into this wonderful building. Um, we celebrated it online, but we had over 100 people um, uh, uh, online for that birthday uh, um, uh, party. And uh, we, it was covered in the local press. And it was really amazing to hear that we were, uh, the, the, and to feel that the size of our community, which stretch, stretches much more beyond the city and the, across the country and across the world, really. People who've been touched by this community, the services and support that we've provided, the volunteering opportunities that it's provided, the partnerships, the Grass Market Community Project, albeit a relatively small grassroots community organization and relatively new charity, um, pushes above its weight in terms of making connections and, 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 and forcing and for, forging collaborations which I'm sure uh, Adam uh, would, would agree with and, and totally. I'm an Edinburgh resident myself, and I totally agree with the, what Adam's point about it, it is probably the best city to live in in the world. However, I also agree with his point that not, not for everyone. I mean, if I was to encapsulate what the Grass Market Community Project is about, essentially it is about making Edinburgh the best place to live uh, in the world for everyone in Edinburgh. Um, we very much work with and support in our community, people who are the hardest to reach or the people who are struggling the most. No more so has this been uh, demonstrated with COVID and uh, the quite fundamental shift onto more online activities where huge numbers of the people that we support were digitally excluded for a variety of different reasons. So a lot of our work this year has been about working with partners such as Edinburgh Council and Scottish Government to try and address that uh, imbalance and to extend the reach of the, this digital age and help people connect. Connection, 
is critical to to our to our project. Uh, it, it, when we talk about connection, we talk about community. It's in the in the title of our charity. We support people through community, through a compassionate community. We support people who are very much in transition in life. Which let's let's be honest, is all of us. You know, we we had people members of this panel talking about raising children. That's a transition. We talk about people leaving families, or in my case, very recently, empty nesting. We talk about people who are moving from uh, a supported accommodation or a lived, have been raised in the care system uh, or are moving out of foster care into their own tenancies. We talk about people who have lost work and are making the transition to unemployment or into retraining, particularly this year. All these transitions could and do happen to any one of us uh, uh, on the panel tonight and anyone watching to, to, to the, 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 this contribution. Um, and. This is what we recognize and this is at the very heart of what we do. Supporting people in transition is about journeying alongside of, side them. Wherever they're at, we try and support people. And we talk about making connections three levels. To yourself, um, <clears throat> which is often lost when people go through transition, to others, so self-compassion, compassion towards others, and to the wider society, community, and to the planet. The, the, it's critical that those three levels are where, where we're working with and supporting one another to make those three connections. And we do that for a variety of activities and social enterprises <clears throat> from uh, art, cooking, making furniture. Uh, uh, we have a, a food uh, um, provision service, soup, what was it called a soup kitchen is now an open door community meal service. We, we run residentials that support people going away together. And we just support people wherever they're at on that journey by living and being alongside them. It's really important so they feel less isolated. To the people that we support, which is a very, a very broad cross-section of the community, they talk about us being their family. They talk about us being the only reason that they're still here, sadly, um, through a whole range of reasons that they've ended up in this situation of massive uh, self-doubt and la loss of aspiration and and uh, drive to, 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 to support themselves. Touching base with us and connecting with us, and like I say, connecting with others has helped them lift, lift their, their being into a, a whole new perspective. We value the contribution that everyone makes to our community, and that, that's why we, we embrace this very broad range of activity, because whether it's um, peeling a potato, washing dishes, making soup, or serving food, or making beautiful furniture, Everybody can, can, can contribute and we pride ourselves. I as CEO pride myself on looking to the least likely to be asked and asking them to contribute to our organization, to our community. And it's a gift. I really believe that it's a gift that I'm giving them to, to be able to give to others. And that's how we support compassion and, and understanding by journeying alongside people and conveying to them that we need them just as much as they need us. And that, that sends a really powerful message to them about their value in, in our lives and in, in our society. So our open door meal service, if you like, we talk about a spectrum of support and services. And at one end of that spectrum is our open door meal service. It's literally open to anyone. It tends to be people who are homeless or vulnerably housed, people who are rough sleeping, people who are in temporary accommodation, or people who've got short-term tenancies, or people whose uh, asylum applications have failed and they have no recourse to public uh, um, uh, sources of funding. And so we, we, we target that service at those people, but it is open to anyone. And it's also a way in if you want to volunteer, giving out food, supporting people. And it's massively grown over the years. It's a very different thing to what it was um, 10 years ago um, in the sense that it now provides free haircuts, um, uh, provides a, a benefit support service where we can help people make sure they're getting everything they're entitled to. Um, we have um, a, a vet service for people who are um, in, in need of additional support and have pets. And we also have a, a community cinema, which is at the tail end of that service. And last year we were voted um, UK Community Cinema of the Year out of recognition that the people that come to our cinema, to our community cinema each week, are probably the most diverse audience you, you, would, you would get in the sense that these people would, or these groups of people would, 
ordinarily not feel that they could access the mainstream cinema because they wouldn't feel that they were welcome or they couldn't afford it or they just they just wouldn't feel it was for them so we're really proud of that and in terms of who we support it's very broad as i say we're much more interested in in the individual and not in any kind of label uh we don't silo people into groups of over here we will work with or support people who've got experience of drug use or over here we'll support and work with people who are homeless we bring people together and we learn from one another and we really value lived experience and we were proud partners in in the uh, um, poverty uh, commission uh, that, that adam spoke of earlier on and uh, led by the edinburgh council many of our members of our community contributed to that uh, very valuable research based on lived experience we're grateful to have been asked and the people that participated found it a very positive process and i'm delighted to have seen the report from that and look forward to seeing the council implementing those recommendations we're a community of volunteers we do have a state a staff team many of whom uh, were once uh, members seeking support themselves that over time became more confident became more skilled and ended up working for us so so about 60 percent of my staff team right now were people who came to us looking for support that are now providing the support and have achieved professional qualifications or on our apprenticeship pathway in our employability programs, mostly in our social enterprises. So one of the reasons we love volunteering so much, as I say, is it conveys this message of um, uh, or opportunity to offer to gift and give to others, but it also sends a very important message to the people you're supporting. When giving compassion is given freely to, to an individual, uh, who ordinarily would only ever have paid professionals or other people using the service in their lives, when they have that, that service and that compassion and that support given freely, voluntarily by someone, then it begs the question, and this is the kind of conversations we hear all the time where people say, why are you helping me? And are you, are you paid? And people say, no, I'm not paid. Why are you here? Are you here because you've got problems? No, I, I'm here to help you. I'm here to support you because I want to be with you i want to be in your company and i want to support you and again that sends a really powerful message to those individuals that someone's in their life because they choose to be as opposed to uh, any sense of uh, um, duty as a professional or uh, um, through their professional training they choose to be in that person's life and they bring with them a whole breadth of experience and, uh, and it can be a very much aspirational relationship so Johnny, I, I'd love for you to go on, but we have to hear from a couple other people sure. and our time is running down. So um, yes, thank no you worries. so much. And I no think problem. maybe if there'll be some questions uh, during our question and answer period. Uh, yes. I think you and all of the others prove that a, a real compassionate community is one where partnership is really necessary uh, and working together for many of you seems very evident and um, I really applaud all of your effort. We're gonna go on to Neela Joshi, uh, who is representing the Edinburgh Women's Interfaith uh, Group right now. Thank you for coming, Neela. Thank you, thank you. Just I would like to say thank you very much, all of you, especially the Mary Kathleen for inviting me to this wonderful cause and I'm very honored to be here today. Thank you. My name is Neela Joshi and I'm from Edinburgh, Edinburgh Interfaith Women's Group. Um, Edinburgh Interfaith Women's Group was born soon after uh, the 9-11, the disaster from America, and the group was formed to form to support local Muslim women. The group was established at the Methodist Church on Nicholson Square in Edinburgh. So I used to go to the, not regularly meetings, but in 2000, and 2000, I become the chair of the group and solemnly I chair and basically run the meetings. Unfortunately, Edinburgh Interfaith Women's Group, we are not a registered charity, so we don't have a fundings or we don't have a permanent residence and we are all volunteers like other groups like Shaktis and Six and Jogs um, and um, Grass Market, uh, the groups and all that. They're all different group, but our group is not registered charity. So we solemnly had to fund ourselves. Since I joined in 2000, 
we lost few of our dearly elderly dear friends and obviously the new members were joined the groups so we because we don't have a funding so we have to um, rely on our uh, ourselves to fund our groups and organize a meeting ourselves so during my time we visited many faith places in edinburgh we visited the synagogues we visited mosque edinburgh hindu temple we visited gurdwara buddhist center german orthodox uh, centers and many many beautiful churches in edinburgh and lothian mm -hmm. uh sometime is very hard to find the um, venue and speakers as well because these days everything is we have to provide the fundings without funding is very difficult um our meetings usually happens on the third wednesday of the month from 7 to 9 9 we used to meet in methodist church but because of the COVID-19, we are organizing most of our meetings in the Zooms. Um, our main reason is that we are the women who are committed to fostering friendship and understanding between ourselves and our local community by providing a safe space for women from a variety of the culture to learn more from each other and help women to affecting the local issues and global Thank you, Neela. And now our, our final speaker is Harriet Harris uh, from the University of Edinburgh and she's the co-director of the Global Compassion Initiative. Harriet. Thanks so much, Marilyn, and thank you, um, Mary Catherine. So yes, the Global Compassion Initiative, uh, Kirsty McGregor, who's also on this call, is a, a co-director. We're, we're two of five co-directors based at the University of Edinburgh um, with research links with um, the universities of, of Stanford and Helsinki in particular, but also with um, universities elsewhere in, in the US and Europe and in Australia. And we're interested in compassion in two directions, outwards in terms of impact in the world, uh, and, the, and, and in, insofar as universities are concerned, the extent to which we contribute to the UN's sustainable development goals. And then inwards in terms of um, how we are as a university community and how other organizations are as communities um, in terms of how compassion contributes to um, educational outcomes, health outcomes, collegiality, fruitfulness or productivity, if, if, uh, if we use that word. Um, health and well-being, uh, reducing absenteeism at work because of improving physical and mental health and speaking to bullying in the workplace. Um, Kirsty McGregor takes a lot of this uh, knowledge and compassion training out, particularly to business communities. Um, and I myself have been working particularly in higher education and also the NHS, so taking compassion workshops out to medical um, consultants. The Global Compassion Initiative launched in 2016 with a summit, um, again, that Kirsty really led on, which addressed compassion in relationship to artificial intelligence. So asking um, what compassion means when uh, machines are increasingly taking over roles that, that have or used to be performed by human beings. So asking some really um, critical ethical questions there and very much engaging the sort of informatics and robotics arms of the university and also the business um, school. Uh, in 2019, last year, we ran um, initially a national convivium with the Scottish government and with the um, Carnegie Trust, looking at what it means to bring compassion, to name compassion as a core value within an organisation. And particularly important to work with Scottish government on this because they've named both compassion and kindness as core values within their national performance um, framework. And so we became very interested in, because we also want, you know, interested in, in Edinburgh University being a compassionate university and Edinburgh City being a compassionate city. It's lovely to have Adam McVeigh on the call because we've, we had in the past had, had um, got some way with Edinburgh City Council with a co sharing an interest in Edinburgh becoming a compassionate city. Um, 
and then things went off in various different directions. So it'd be fantastic to pick that work up again. Um, but once you name compassion as a core value, you need to know what you mean by that and, and what effects you're expecting then to see within a community or an organization or a city or a country. Um, and so we've wanted to investigate what, what that means, uh, both with the Scottish government and, and with others. And then we held an international convivium, bringing our Stanford and Helsinki par partners on and, and other universities um, from around the world. Um, we're working now towards an international conference on science and compassion um, to dovetail with COP26, um, which is due to be based in Scotland in, in 20, um, 21. So maybe that's all I'll say now, Marilyn, because people, people I'm sure have got lots of questions for all of our speakers. So I'll wrap it up there. Great, thank you. And, and I'm uh, wondering if you are in contact with Compassionate Belfast. Because Kirsty, do you do you want to speak to that? Because um, with, with, the, with the conference we're planning next year, there's the Belfast link. Yeah, right, right. Yes, yes. Well, our partners at Stanford Sea Care were working with Belfast to create this, uh, um, the conference on the science of compassion. And that has not come to fruition. So they've moved to us and we will be welcoming in the partnership with Belfast, I'm sure, as much as we can. Right. Uh, it's very exciting, um, all very early stage, but right. uh, we're, 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 we're very excited. And thanks, Mary. great, great summary. <laughs> Thanks so much. So let, there's a lot going on in the chat room, uh, but I don't see any real questions uh, yet but I will just open it up and, and see if people do have questions uh, of the group. I mean, there was an awful lot of information shared uh, throughout this. And Mary Catherine, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Um, I guess be, before we deal with any questions, I'd just like to say that um, for each of the panelists, uh, I had gathered the name and, and the and the and the organization or project or initiative with which you were involved and a website or websites. And so those have been put in the chat uh, for, for any, any, who are, any guests who are here or listening in or for all panelists to have that information from each other. So just to know you, that that's part of what's in the chat. So be, be sure that when you go down and you save that chat and you have that. Um, I would also just like to thank all of you for, for being here. Uh, it's really a delight to, to be able to highlight and affirm, listen to and affirm the good work that you're doing. So um, are there any questions that from, I don't know how this works, Marilyn, in terms of uh, other folks or people, panelists asking each other questions or uh, there are we other can webinars. certainly open it up to panelists asking each other questions, but as well, uh, people who are here and we have, you know, if, if I just look at the names, we have representatives from a number of compassionate cities around the world uh, who might be interested in uh, making contact with you or having some questions that they'd like to ask. And if you do, uh, please just put those questions in the chat. Right. So we'll just take it from I, there. I'm not sure how I can find when with. I I'll see. let you, I'll let you know if okay. there's something uh, in in the chat box. All right. So are there any questions from anybody? Uh, questions, comments, reflections. And um, I quite happy to say the six and Yogi is doing absolutely wonderful job. Uh, but because the, um, the Edinburgh Interfaith Women's Group, we got uh, some of the vulner vulnerable elderly, elderly members in the community, and they will really, really appreciate some help or some food parcel from them, if it's possible. Um, because uh, during this lockdown, some of our members are over 80s and the, they can't go out, and we are not a funded organization. So we can only do so much for those people, even though Scottish Interfaith provided some funding. So I managed to uh, deliver uh, nearly 25 ladies uh, in Edinburgh and Lothian, the small food parcels and all that. Um, if the Sanjo can help us in that one, we'll be very grateful. 
Definitely need Neela. If you can just, um, you have our email address, and if you uh -huh. can just email me and we can speak and speed up all uh, organize that. If you can just give us the names and addresses, contact details, mm -hmm. and um, we will put that into place as soon as possible. Oh, that will be wonderful. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, another one, the Johnny, uh, Johnny Kindros from the um, Grass Market Community Project. He did mention it about uh, some cinema, cinemas and free haircuts and things like that. In Interfaith, we got a few members as well. So I was wondering, maybe I can direct them to Johnny, to you, if it's possible. Maybe I can have your email address. Yes, absolutely. Of course you can, yes. Yep, and abs without a doubt. Yep, we do. We have a wonderful hairdresser. For the a female hairdresser, if they want, to, if that was more comfortable as well, so they can have the, uh, a female only, but we also have a, a gents uh, barber as well. Yeah. But I, 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 I'm always in, interested in building capacity. And I know that a, a number of you might know uh, hairdressers or barbers that might also be willing to give some time as well. And then, so, yeah. so my ask would be absolutely, please do send people down on a Wednesday. Every Wednesday at five o'clock, we have our open door meal service. Literally anyone can walk in get haircuts, get support, and get free food, get, get community. It's all socially distanced and very well managed. I just want to reassure everyone. Um, but um, that would be yeah. a thing to do. But we can also put in additional support, have someone ready to receive them or bring them in sooner. If they were found coming in to a group situation more intimidating, we can make, arrange that for the first time that the people you're talking about access the service. We can make sure someone's uh, met them beforehand or meet them on the door that night specifically looking out for them it's all about that welcome so we can do that but you One might thing. also know of people who are willing to cut hair which would be great as I well also, as well. i also work for edinburgh city libraries as well so through the library doors we receive so many people and some of the people's are excellent needs and all that some of them are refugee some of them are people are homeless people and all that they just comes in the library for shelter in the winter yeah. month. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll love to direct them to you, your project as well. I'll be very grateful, yeah. thank you. Um, and in response to, to your question earlier about emails, um, I have been uh, in, the, in the correspondence I've had with you to get this organized, everybody's email is there. So you should have the email. Plus, as I said, in the chat, you'll also have the, the website. So hopefully that will keep you keep you together. And I'll be following up with this too. So we'll have a chance to see um, after this is over, you know, I'll be in touch with you, all of you. And if there are any ways you'd like to follow up, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, and however, it can be supportive of that, because this is a compassionate Edinburgh, you're already doing good work. Um, and some of you are already connected with each other and you're obviously asking to stay connected in some ways or increase connection. So uh, we'll do what we can to facilitate that and help encourage that. I, I just wanted to share some messages that are coming through uh, from people who are watching this webinar. Um, one from Olivia McIvar from Vancouver, Canada, uh, and she doesn't have a question. She just wants to thank you all for your amazing work that you're doing. And Olivia is our coordinator uh, for the Compassion Education Institute. And Catherine Van Oom from St. Louis, Missouri is real interested in the conference. And one thing, uh, she wants to be on the list. So uh, we also, when this is finished and processed, we will send everyone who registered, um, you know, a link to the recording. And also um, we will send um, links uh, to your email addresses. Uh, we've already saved the, the chat. I think I'm going to save it again. Um, and then also um, I see Beth, uh, we will definitely uh, make certain we have a number of cities, especially Atlanta, Clarksville, Georgia, Fayetteville, Arkansas, who uh, have as part of their compassion initiative action programs, uh, working with refugees and immigrants. And I know there are a number of cities in Canada that we might be able to uh, make connection with you. Um, so I, we're right at the top of the hour. And Mary Beth, I'm wondering if you want to say a, a few words in closing. 
You mean Mary, me? Mary yes, Catherine? Mary, Kay, Mary Catherine, sorry. I just want to say thank you. Um, it is a, truly a delight to be uh, to have found out from Marilyn and the charter that they would offer this kind of webinar to highlight the good work people is people are doing. So, so it was truly a joy to be able to invite you. I know it's just a start. I know there are many others uh, in the Edinburgh area and throughout Scotland who are doing wonderful work. But at least we've gotten a step number one. And um, I will be in touch with you. And I'm grateful for your work. You're, you're a step ahead because uh, early next year, we will have one of our calls will be Compassionate UK. Uh, so we'll hear from people from uh, Oxford and Belfast and a number of other places. So that should be uh, pretty exciting. So watch out for that. Uh, and we will, I think we're starting the year out with Compassionate Pakistan. Uh, so um, we would welcome your participation at that time. And watch yourself on Facebook in the next few days. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. 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 Thank you.